Good afternoon and welcome everybody to this presentation and celebration of a brand new book called Marriage, Migration and Integration. Um, if you've been following media reports or political debates about marriage migration in Europe at all, you will have come across this particular story that is told about how transnational marriages of second generation uh, migrants with um, import grooms or import brides, how these types of transnational uh, marriages are bad for integration. Um, but we don't actually know what the impact of transnational marriages on the social life, the working life, the sense of belonging of transnational couples and their families are. So we don't know whether this political story that is so all around us, um, whether that political story is based on facts or not. And the book that we're talking about today uh, makes some very significant steps in, in filling that uh, knowledge gap. So with us today are three of the authors, uh, Professor Catherine Charsley, who's Professor of Migration Studies at the University of Bristol, uh, Dr. Sarah Spencer, who is Senior Fellow at COMPAS at the University of Oxford, um, and Evelyn Ersanili, Dr. Evelyn Ersanili, I forgot your title there, um, who works at the Department of Political Science with me at the University of Amsterdam. I am Saskia Bonjour. I will also work at the Department of Political Science as, a universe, as an associate professor. Um, the fourth author of the book, uh, Marta Bolognani, uh, can't be with us today. Now, what we're going to do today is first, uh, Catherine Charsley is going to present the main findings of the book after which Kavri Qureshi, who is a lecturer in global health at the University of Edinburgh, will share her reflections on the book. And after that, there will be uh, plenty of time for you to ask questions about the book to the author. So Catherine, the floor is all yours. Thank you very much. So I'll just share my screen. Uh, here we go. Is that all up and working? Good. Well, thank you all for coming here, uh, well, virtually, to uh, celebrate the launch of our book, Marriage, Migration and Integration, uh, which is based on a three-year uh, ESRC-funded collaboration by, between the universities of Bristol and Oxford, where Evelyn used to work uh, before she moved to Amsterdam. So I'm Catherine Charsley. I'm going to introduce the book and give you a bit of a taster of what it contains. So not quite a, a full sort of overview because there's a lot in the book. But first I should introduce my wonderful co-authors. It's been a pleasure to work with um, Sarah Spencer, um, Evelyn Arcellini, uh, now of Amsterdam, of course, who did the, the quantitative work, Marta Bolognani, who isn't here today, but was the fabulous qualitative researcher on the project. It was a bit of a dream team and such a pleasure to work with you all. So let's set the scene. Oops, oh, sorry, I forgot previous. Sorry, I had these glamorous pictures of, uh, of everybody to show you while I introduced you to everybody. <laughs> so let's set the scene. Um, as Saskia has said, uh, marriage or partner migration has been problematized in recent political discourses. It's a really significant uh, source of immigration to Europe, and I'm including uh, the UK in that. And there's been an increasing tendency to view some kinds of marriage migration as problematic in terms of integration. And that's the intra-ethnic transnational marriages of ethnic minorities. And by that, I mean, for example, when European descendants of uh, migrants from Pakistan or Turkey or North Africa, when they marry a partner from their parents or grandparents' country of origin who migrates to join them. And these kinds of marriages are often discussed as both uh, a sign of a lack of integration and a barrier to integration. So they're often presented as um, indicating problematic cultural differences around gender, but also as inhibiting integration through a variety of mechanisms. So first as creating a sort of temporal loop uh, in the form of a first generation in every generation, meaning that processes of integration are sent back to the beginning. Second, as importing poverty through the assumed 
limited education and labour market prospects of migrant spouses, and as importing traditionalism, particularly around gender expectations, reinforcing cultural difference with implications, for example, for the employment of women. And restrictions to spousal immigration have increasingly been justified with reference to these kinds of integration concerns. So in the UK, we've seen pre-entry English language requirements and income requirements for the sponsoring spouse presented as measures to promote integration. But as Saskia says, what's striking when you look at the research is there's actually rather limited evidence on the relationships between marriage migration and processes of integration. And what there is tends to be focused on particular aspects uh, of integration, most commonly labour market integration. So in our new book, uh, we examine this question using existing survey data and quantitative, uh, qualitative research, new qualitative research. We focus on the two largest uh, ethnic groups involved in the UK context, British Pakistani Muslims and British Indian Sikhs. British Pakistani Muslims are often the focus of integration concerns, integration discourses, but British Indian Sikhs uh, far less often. And although our, our quantitative analysis shows for the first time that rates of transnational marriage in both these groups are declining, uh, the proportions of transnational marriage remain um, significant. We compare two types of intra-ethnic couples, those where both spouses are from the UK with uh, those in which one partner is a migrant from India or Pakistan, so that we can better identify uh, what might be specific about the trajectories of couples in which one partner is a migrant. And we use a distinctive sibling pair methodology uh, as the core of the qualitative research. The majority of migrant spouses are wives, uh, but husbands form a substantial minority and there are important gender differences. So we looked at both uh, those kinds of situations. Now, of course, when we're talking about integration, we need to be clear what we mean by integration, which is a controversial concept. It's been criticized for normative assumptions on how migrants ought to integrate for emphasizing migrants' responsibility for integration rather than looking at society as a whole, and for a selective focus on particular aspects of integration at the expense of wider perspectives. So we use a definition of integration that seeks to avoid those traps. So you'll see it identifies five dimensions in which integration processes uh, take place. The structural, so participation in labor or housing market, for example, social, meaning social uh, interactions and relationships, cultural, changing attitudes, uh, behavior, lifestyle, civic and political participation in community life and democratic processes, and identity, development of a shared identity and sense of belonging, for example. And the definition notes that integration processes can proceed, uh, but also can change direction. So engagement in labor market can cease with unemployment, for example and uh, that integration has uh, spatial and transnational dimensions. And of course, uh, these processes develop and change over time. So we brought all of this together in a, a heuristic model, um, as you see here. The diagram shows three characteristics of the processes that I particularly want to draw to your attention before I get on to the empirical uh, findings. So first you'll see that individuals are part of families and social networks, um, whether in countries of residence or transnationally, and they can provide opportunities and constraints across uh, each of these spheres. Second, there are um, illustrative arrows between some of those dimensions, and that's to indicate that uh, the impacts which engagements in one dimension uh, can have on engagements in another. So this interdependence um, and interaction of domains, that's important, but it's something that's often overlooked in integration research. And it can be positive or negative. So some of our British Indian Sikh respondents, for example, who would score as highly integrated on most conventional measures, they spoke of a negative impact of their political engagement on their identity. When recent revelations about the British government's role in the Golden Temple massacre led some to, to question uh, the meaning of Britishness, their sense of Britishness. Finally, various types of effectors which can impact on these processes are identified. Those relating to individuals, um, such as gender or qualifications, 
to families, such as resources, expectations, or caring responsibilities, to society, um, such as the availability of jobs, but also discrimination, transnational engagement, such as the need to send remittances, and finally, to policy intervention. And that's not just related to immigration and integration policy, visa rules or language class provision, for example, but also the wider policy landscape. So this, inter, uh, this understanding of integration situated uh, marriage migration for us amidst the full complexity of the processes at play and the multiplicity of effectors uh, that could be impacting on them. It also drew our attention to what we can and can't do. So it was much easier methodologically for us to get data on migrants and their families than, for instance, on the job opportunities available at a particular place at a particular point in time. And given the complexity of processes of integration, it's key that any research identifies and acknowledges its inevitable limitations. So this model um, informed our research design and our analysis and our findings in turn reinforce aspects of the model. And this is brought out in the chapters, uh, throughout the chapters uh, in the book. Now, as you can see, um, we're dealing with a wide range of issues uh, and it's not, a, it's not a skinny book. So I don't have time today to go through all of our findings, but we write about researching integration as like untangling a complicated knot identifying the various strands and teasing apart their relationships to each other. So what I thought I'd do is start with one strand and show you what is revealed when we start to follow its connections to other aspects of integration through our mixed methods um, and comparative approach. So I thought I'd um, start much existing research focus on employment because it's often taken as a key indicator in the structural domain of integration. So I thought I'd start with that and see where that leads us. So here are some labor force survey statistics on employment by couple type, by gender and by ethnic group. And of course, in the book, we do discuss issues of discrimination, lack of uh, recognition of qualifications because these differences aren't just explained by level of education. But today I wanted to explore some other aspects because these kinds of statistics are frequently used as evidence of um, lack of integration, low employment rates for women, particularly migrant wives. And we can clearly see that migrant wives do have lower rates of, uh, uh, of employment, of paid employment, than British co-ethnics. And that's particularly the case amongst Pakistani Muslims. But levels of employment overall are higher in the Indian Sikh group and in our qualitative material, it seemed that employment was expected often of Indian Sikh women alongside their domestic roles. So that's one area of significant um, ethnic uh, variation. We can also comment on the idea that marrying a man from overseas assumed to have more traditional gender role expectations might suppress women's employment. And there does seem to be lower employment amongst British Indian Sikh women married to migrants. So you can see that on the, the bottom right. But further analysis by Evelyn uh, suggests uh, that that's explained by their lower level of education compared to those women who are married within the UK, that top category, inter international marriages. And although these kinds of concern often focus on Muslim populations, we can see on the top right that British Pakistani women married to migrant husbands, they don't have lower employment rates than those who are married to British co-ethnics. So let's take that issue and start to trace some of its wider connections. Because in our qualitative material, for some British Pakistani women, marriage to a husband from Pakistan actually seemed to be part of a trajectory of maintaining or increasing autonomy, a version of the Levens hypothesis uh, for those of you who are familiar with the literature. So in this case of three sisters, the eldest married a cousin from Pakistan who moved to the UK to live with her. So she avoided the conventional daughter-in-law role. Her parents-in-law were overseas and she stayed living close to her own family, uh, enjoying their support. And she felt she enjoyed considerable freedom. So she passed that advice on to her sister, Madia, um, who saw an additional benefit in distancing herself from caring responsibilities uh, from her natal family. And she's embarked after her marriage to a migrant on a much wider social life. She's fundraising with her children's school. So although she isn't in paid employment, 
uh, the marriage has expanded her engagement in social and civic spheres. And interestingly, by contrast, their youngest sister, uh, Kantara, had what was described as a love marriage to a, another British Pakistani. And that would conventionally be viewed as perhaps more progressive than the parentally arranged uh, marriages of her sister. But she moved to another area of the city to live with her in-laws, who restricted her freedom considerably. And her experience in divorce confirmed the sisters in their belief that it's easier to be married to a migrant. So that family really challenges the often assumed association between transnational marriage and traditionalism. And it also really undermines the idea that uh, cultural impact of a first generation in every generation, taking the family back to integration uh, zero in integration terms, because one migrant coming into a British extended uh, family is unlikely to be able to set the tone for the household culture in terms of gender roles. We also saw this in terms of language. And we have fascinating material on extended family living, which explores this further. But this issue of traditionalism is complicated, not least because it's one you'll often hear British South Asian themselves talk about. So families who are looking for a bride in the subcontinent, they often expect that a woman from India or Pakistan will be more traditional in their gender role expectations, happy to accept uh, domestic and caring roles. Although as we saw for Sikhs, that often goes alongside an expectation they'll engage in paid employment. And receiving families' expectations are one variety of uh, the effectors on the trajectories of uh, their new members. So we had several examples in the qualitative material of particularly more educated women from India or Pakistan, because the stereotype of uh, the uneducated migrant bride masks the educational capital that many, uh, many actually have. And these women sometimes find that their aspirations to work or to live more autonomously came into conflict with the expectations of the British family into whom they'd married and to which they'd married. So that complicates the mapping of traditionalism onto countries of origin. But let's go back to that uh, employment graph and turn to look at the migrant husbands. Because in those discourses which treat uh, employment as a marker of integration, what's left often noted is the very high rates of employment for migrant husbands. So they don't have a lower uh, employment rate than British born co-ethnics. And that speaks strongly to one of the advantages of a migrant coming through marriage into a UK family. Because they're usually able, that family, to help their new member to gain employment. But it also brings us to another key aspect of our conceptual model, uh, the interactions between processes in different domains. Because those jobs that families can provide, they're often low paid. And the migrant husband is often expecting not just to support their new family in the UK, but also to remit to their parents. Um, in the conventional sort of South Asian marriage where a daughter-in-law moves to her husband's family household, contributing to that one household would do both. But to fulfill that dual responsibility, we encountered migrant husbands often working long or unsociable hours. And that left some uh, Pakistani migrant husbands we encountered with little time and energy for building new social networks or investing in skills which could uh, improve their employment situation in those first few years. They're also often working alongside other migrants in these low paid labor market niches. So even the opportunity to practice their English um, isn't necessarily uh, to be taken for granted. So although employment is commonly used as an indicator of integration and one which can facilitate processes of integration more widely, people developing their social networks, cultural familiarity and language skills through employment. And we certainly had uh, examples of that, but here in this case, poor work, uh, combines with life course and migration issues to have the opposite effect, uh, impeding some other processes of integration. And that example of the busy working migrant husbands brings us to temporality in a wider sense, because integration is a temporal process and it has relationships with other temporal processes, including uh, those of the life course. Now, because we included uh, couples whose marriage didn't involve migration, uh, we could disentangle transnational marriage and marriage uh, migration as one effector from others related to the life course. Uh, 
So for pretty much all participants, regardless of how they were married, marriage and the birth of children, which often was expected to follow on quite quickly. Um, this is a, a time of uh, life, a signal of a new phase of the life course where uh, men were under particular pressure to earn for their new families and the social sphere tended to become more focused on family life, both for men and for women. But marriage migrants moved to a new country at the same time as entering this family focused uh, phase of the life course. So not only do work and parenthood often leave little time for a wider social life, but a migrant's lack of uh, local social networks intensify that social focus on the family. And transnational remittance obligations can heighten the pressure on men in particular to work long and unsociable hours. And for migrant wives, well, even those who didn't grow up expecting to work, um, they sometimes developed interests in employment uh, from watching their British sisters-in-law and other family members pursue careers. But having come into a new country and straight into this family-focused phase of the life course, and then spending many years in those kinds of patterns whilst children were young, that means that it might be challenging to develop the, the knowledge and the confidence to enter the workplace, the workforce later on. So we suggested one of our um, policy recommendations is for signposting and assistance, uh, not just to be provided when people arrive in the country, but also should be available um, later. This issue of temporality and aspirations often uh, also provides an opportunity to explore ways in which effectors of various kind interact. So coming towards the end of my little presentation, I just wanted to tell you about this case study of Nabila, who is a, a migrant wife from Pakistan, and she has an MA in English literature. She taught at a university in Pakistan. In order to teach perhaps at a lower level in the UK, she needed to convert her qualifications and her husband and his family were really supportive of her aspirations. But as a recent migrant, she wasn't able to apply for a student loan and she would have to pay higher overseas student fees. And that put this training uh, beyond the family's economic reach. And by the time she gains access to student funding and home student fee levels, it's likely she'll have entered motherhood when caring responsibilities may well provide a new barrier to structural engagement through employment. So Nabila's story speaks once more to those life course issues, but also illustrates the way in which policy effectors can operate as a barrier to integration, despite apparent advantages in terms of individual human capital and, and family support. So I hope that's given you a taster of how we go about untangling the knot. That's the question of in, uh, relationships between marriage migration and integration. There's plenty more to discover in the book. So I started with employment today, but that's by no means our main focus. As you can see on the right, that's our uh, chapter headings page. Um, and the, the chapters cover various aspects of integration and its interconnections. Along the way, we uncover uh, complexities, as I've suggested today, that challenge many of the simplistic assumptions about ethnic minority transnational marriage, which often appear in policy and also sometimes in academic and um, discourses. And in our discussion on belonging and identity, you can see in chapter eight, we also chart some of the negative impact that these kinds of finger pointing discourses of problematic integration and the restrictions to family life, which they use to justify, so some of the, the negative impacts um, which uh, can themselves have on processes of integration, because our participants were often well aware, particularly the British Pakistani participants, that these discourses and immigration measures were targeted at them in particular. So I'll just end with our thanks to some key people without whom the book uh, would not have been possible. And of course, the participants whose memorable counts and turns of phrase made working on the book really such a pleasure. And in case any of this has whetted your appetite to read the book, there's a discount code, um, which I believe will also be circulated in the chat. Thank you very much. So I will stop sharing and hand over to Kavri. Thank you so much, Catherine. So Kavri Qureshi will share some of her thoughts on this book. Kavri comes, joins us from the University of Edinburgh and her home. <laughs> from my kitchen. 
Um, thanks so much. Uh, the first thing I wanted to say was a huge congratulations to Catherine, Sarah, Evelyn and Martha for this wonderful book. Um, to give some indication of how excited I was about this book's publication, um, I ordered it immediately from the University Library and the very afternoon it came in, I read it cover to cover. So that is just some signal of how excited I was about this book. And I was about excited about the project from its inception, really, um, from from the, for the kinds of reasons that Catherine and Saskia talked about, given the ubiquity of these sort of insidious assumptions which are made about the relationships between marriage, migration and integration. It's very infuriating to see how, how unsubstantiated this is. And this project was designed so intelligently and so elegantly to test those unsubstantiated assumptions and provide us some really rich and important em empirical material to kind of redress some of our thinking about this um, and, and the, the book delivers really brilliantly on, on that project. Um, I just wanted to offer a few words of appreciation really um, for the, um, the qualitative and the quantitative materials that are drawn on and developed in the book. The methodology of interviewing across pairs of siblings was a really ingenious one, um, but it was also a very challenging one. And I used to just imagine Martha doing this fieldwork, not only is doing qualitative fieldwork difficult enough, but being able to then have to say to someone, we'd be really interested to interview but only if we can also interview your brother just felt really painful so it was a no doubt um, a very challenging project requiring very dogged and persistent field work from Martha and it generated such I mean she delivered on it so beautifully it generated such rich deep dive material that really pushes our thinking and assumptions on a lot of issues. And uh, similarly, Evelyn's work with the Labour Force Survey, as someone who's myself tried to get into the Labour Force Survey files, I think I can truly appreciate how intelligently she has done these analyses and, and not only you know, her acumen, but also her, her imaginativeness in using the data sets. She's done things with these data sets that I would never have dreamed of been, are, are even possible. So, you know, a huge um, shout out and a, an appreciation of all of the effort that went in to uh, generating the evidence base that the book um, builds upon. Um, I'll talk just a little bit about some of the highlights in the findings from my perspective, some of the things that I'll be turning back to the book again and again and sort of rereading and, and thinking about some of the things which I think um, are really important novel pieces of uh, uh, perspectives which are introduced are, first of all, you know, the quantitative analyses that Evelyn, uh, Evelyn pre uh, presents in, in, I think, chapter three of the differentiation in the popularity and prevalence of transnational marriage. And she's tracked this not only across educational cohorts, um, but also across generational cohorts, as well as between the, um, the, the main sort of comparison of Pakistani Muslims and, and Indian Sikhs. There's really interesting and, and nuanced picture that emerges there. Similarly, I think the data on um, her investigations of educational hypergamy and this question of sort of whether British based families are able to trade off maybe limited marital capital in other domains um, but by deploying this sort of British nationality and citizenship to to marry up in educational terms when uh, when engaging in transnational marriage there's some really nuanced findings around that in the book I think the data on labor force participation is really powerful as well as someone who often goes into the statistics on um, uh, South Asian women's participation in the labor force. It's actually the first time that I've seen that, and especially in such up-to-date data, um, so systematically across migrant versus British born generations. So there's really useful data there. And I also really love the material in the book where you're testing this Lieben's hypothesis that Catherine referred to, um, this idea of whether, um, whether actually what might look like a traditional marriage form is, is allowing women to renegotiate forms of autonomy by engaging in a kind of marriage, which means that they won't have to be constantly under the thumb of in-laws. And I think there's some really nuanced conclusions there with very far reaching implications regarding gendered agency and how that plays out in marriage negotiation in a transnational context. I just wanted to end by thinking about three of what, to my mind, are really politically significant and important sort of policy informing conclusions from the book and maybe take those as a point of discussion. Firstly, this sort of new model of integration that you've developed, um, uh, uh, and I'm sure sort of this is this is a lot of Sarah's thinking on in there as well. Um, 
which is building in really beautifully, not only the temporal dimension, but also the gendered life course component. So the ways in which processes of family building may close down opportunities at one point, but then also open up opportunities at a different point. Um, and, and there are some important policy implications there with uh, regards to the situation of, 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 of women like Nabila, who Catherine talked about in her presentation, educated migrants who are unable to study further or convert qualifications into um, uh, qualifications into, that would be regarded in the UK context because they would categorize, be categorized as overseas students. And by the time they, requ uh, they acquire their indefinite leave and can qualify as home students, they've had children and are now no longer in that phase of life where they can contemplate re-entering study. I think there's some really important policy teachings there about the need for multi-pronged social policy responses straddling across education and labour market sectors and it really shows us how this problem of the unintegrated marriage migrant if there is one at all is a product of our own exclusionary citizenship and rights regime rather than something that migrants are bringing with them when they enter the country. I also think there's some really important policy conclusions um, in this critique of the current regime of spousal immigration current system post 2012 which is articulated in the book first very trenchantly by the informants who themselves have very strong opinions about the new family rules that came in in 2012 um, but is really sort of developed in important ways by the authors as well and shows us to have you know and is shown to be a, a, a classist and highly exclusionary system especially with the income requirements which violate people's rights to a family life and, and must be overturned as migrant rights organizations have called and for. And then finally, um, I think there's some really important policy relevant material in the final chapters of the book, um, where, um, where the authors unpick the ubiquity of experiences of discrimination, racial discrimination, on two levels, both within families, so processes of intra-ethnic racism, xeno-racial, xeno-racisms within one's own family, or the family that you've married into, as well as in inter-ethnic racial discrimination, and this is a really important part of the story. And here, I suppose, um, I'm left with a few questions about ways in which that analysis could be taken even further. Um, for us, as I'm sure you've, you've all read, there's much research documenting how harmful immigration policies devalue migrant spouses and create them as disposable and dispensable through tools like probationary visa rules and the no recourse to public funds um, stipulations. So these legal frameworks interact with and pack into and create and reinforce and actually enable this kind of xeno-racial or uh, xeno-racism at the intra-ethnic level um, and, and enable an, a, you know, a certain amount of domestic control and, and domestic abuse at the far ends of the spectrum, um, which is, you know, reflected in the very forms of, of abuse which are recounted. You know, the, 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 the frequency with which I've heard migrant spouses talking about how their, how their passports have been confiscated by the families, uh, by their in-laws in the UK, and they've not been allowed to call home and talk to their parents and so on. Um, and this isn't sort of emphasized so much in the book, and quite understandably, as you point out, it was it would have been difficult to really dig around here, given the methodology you were using in the qualitative interviews, whether you were sibling pairs interviews, family interviews, where it would have been quite difficult for people to, to breach these issues. But I think all I wanted to say is that, you know, actually the current framework is even worse than, than what you've shown us. And there is a potential for sort of um, for, for for extending this even further in ways that would be useful to, for example, black feminist organisations like South or Black Sisters who've been working on no recourse to public funds issues. Um, so if you have any further thoughts about that, I would love to hear them. But I think I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kavari, for such a thorough and enthusiastic uh, discussion of the book. Um, so the audience is very welcome to share any questions you might have. You can do so in the chat uh, on YouTube or in the Q&A um, in this uh, Zoom webinar. And there's one question already, which I think is for Catherine or Evelyn. Evelyn, I'm not sure. It, it goes like this. We know that not only trans transnational migrant wives or husbands suffer from difficulties integrating in British society. What is the difference between the problems British Pakistanis have and those of transnational migrant wives or husbands? Thank you. Shall I come in and 
say a bit on that. Um, uh, and then I'll come back to what, what Carberry said. Um, so first, I guess it's probably not the, the language that, that we would probably use. Um, uh, the difficulties in difficulties in integrating. Uh, I guess we'd want to pick that apart a bit and see what, what you meant by that. But certainly, for example, um, we can give some, uh, some examples of differences, say, in structural and labour market experiences uh, between British Pakistanis and the British South Asians and transnational um, and the, the migrant husbands and wives. Um, because both well, all, all we had reports of experience of discrimination, both in finding work and in workplaces from uh, British South Asian partners. But then for migrants, uh, they have, in addition to that, uh, sometimes issues of, of language, although not all. Um, for many of the English was a, a language of instruction in, in schools for, for many of the migrant husbands or wives, um, but also the lack of um, uh, recognition of overseas qualifications, for example, that adds to uh, problems uh, in the labour market. Uh, was there anything that either of you, Sarah or Evelyn, would like to add to that or expand on? No, I think those are some of the, the key issues that we saw, the qualifications for some uh, language um, and what I also found interesting and what you already talked about a bit, this idea that um, transnational, especially migrant husbands, they do tend to find employment rather easily, but that is oftentimes within the ethnic niche and might that be a place where they get stuck, especially because they're working uh, uh, many hours or in sociable hours, it makes it difficult for them um, to build on their qualifications or to look for other jobs. One of the numbers that I was really intrigued by was the share of migrant husbands, especially for the Pakistani group, that works in the taxi industry. Um, I don't have it at the top of my mind now, but maybe I can quickly look it up. Uh, I don't know if you have it right here. It's... Um, Sorry, out of those who have been in the UK for quite some years, Pakistani migrant husbands, 40% work as a taxi driver, which is both an advantage in the terms of that it's a relatively well-paid job compared to some other jobs, right? But especially if you have a bit more education potential, it's a job you tend to get um, stuck in, right? Also because of the hours that, that come with it. So I thought that was an interesting, it feeds into literature that we know about the ups and downs of ethnic niches, um, but that's something that, that stood out to me. I suppose one could add to that the, the access to information. And one of the interesting findings was that the migrant spouse is so dependent on the family as their primary source of information on where they might get jobs or whether they've got access to education and so on. Um, and I think Catherine pointed to that in a way as a policy recommendation that we should ensure that there are other sources of information, particularly when people first arrive, but then ongoing from there so that they're not so dependent. Some families are obviously very forthcoming with a range of information and choices, and others we found were, were more economical with the information they provided. So that additional source of information would be one way to overcome that particular challenge that people from abroad face. Would you perhaps like to respond to some of the uh, points raised by Kaveri? Oh yes, so I'd like to come in uh, with Kaveri's uh, ending point there. And thank you Kaveri for such a, a great, uh, well, extra talk and cheerleading for our book. Um, it's been, I'm equally excited. So Kaveri, uh, for those of you who don't know, Kaveri has done recent really good work on um, issues of marital instability and divorce. And so I think that there's, uh, there's a, a great complementarity between our work, because obviously that was one of the uh, restrictions of going in with the, the sibling pair methodology was that we were perhaps less likely to get stories of 
unsuccessful marriages, stories of uh, abuse and so forth. Although we, um, as Calvary also said, the, the, the sample was very challenging. So where we didn't, where we didn't manage to get um, enough complete sibling pair sets, we did uh, additional uh, interviews and, and focus groups. So we did get some uh, of those kinds of stories coming in that way. Um, and, uh, but th there's always a tension also in writing about South Asian transnational marriage of um, the tension between wanting to recognize those kinds of issues that, that Carvery spoke about, where the immigration regulations can exacerbate uh, inequalities of power with uh, migrant spouses usually at the, the, the receiving end of the worst end of that, uh, of that inequality of power. Um, and so there's always, there's always a tension between recognizing those issues and not just uh, reinvigorating quite pathologizing discourses about um, British South Asian, and particularly British South Asian Muslim families and recognizing the ways in which families are often very supportive and promoting of their, uh, their new members as well. Um, so even so somewhere in the, 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 the talk, I had the example of Harmit, who when she came, she had a lot of tensions with her mother-in-law who wanted to ask her to ask permission to go out and cover her head. And, um, and they had a lot of clashes, but eventually her mother actually became, so this is another thing that these, these processes changed dramatically over time. So if you had a look at Harmit when she just arrived, her situation would have looked one way, but a few years later, her mother was actively providing childcare to enable Harmit to develop a, a, a her career. Um, and so there's always a, a tension in how you, um, how you represent these very varied experiences uh, without falling into the trap of either downplaying problematic dynamics or falling into those uh, uh, pathologizing discourses. If that makes sense. Don't know if any of my other uh, co-authors wanted to say anything about Harvey's uh, wonderful contribution. I think I want to pick up on one more thing. It's it's also part of the book, but it's also a separate article coming out of the project that uh, uh, Catherine and Marta Volagnani wrote about this tension between the newcomers and the uh, kind of settled uh, communities. And this, I think, what what did you call it? You called it intra-ethnic racism, Gavri, is that correct? Um, <laughs> it's a, it's a, I mean, it's, it, it comes from that article that Catherine and, and Martha did on being a freshie is not cool. Yeah, so Catherine, maybe you can briefly uh, say a bit more about that, that dynamic. Uh, yes, okay. Yeah, the article is um, in Ethnic and Racial Studies a, couple, a few years ago, and it's called Being a Freshie is Not Cool, and explores this, uh, the stereotype of the, uh, the freshie, um, the uh, fresh off the boat, the new migrant from the subcontinent, because there are a lot of stereotypes about such migrants as well, uh, quite close to sort of stereo the, the mainstream stereotypes of, of problematic integration, of speaking poor English, of working in, um, in uh, certain sectors, shop work and, and so forth. Um, but also the ways in which there are also cultural stereotypes about bodily practices, an element of disgust sometimes, and we certainly had people um, in uh, migrant, migrant husbands and wives, sometimes they're, they're British partners in our, uh, our project for this, uh, Marriage, Migration, Integration, talking about this as a social barrier for uh, incoming uh, migrants. So I guess that's another in response to the first question in the Q&A, additional challenges for migrant husbands and wives. Well, in the, the literature about uh, social capital and integration, it's often assumed that there's going to be this inter, intra-ethnic bonding capital, that there will be uh, barrier, either a focus on the ethnic group and, or barriers to or both uh, uh, forming relationships across the ethnic boundary, but it's kind of taken for granted that there will be bonding within the, the ethnic group. 
um, and that really uh, problem problematizes that uh, that as well. Thank you very much. There's another question from the audience. Um, one attendee thinks that the question of information is crucial. However, taking the example of job search information, authors such as Bloch report that public employment services for immigrants and refugees also tend to favor any employment over no employment. How could you improve the quality of information provided beyond close relative networks? Do you want me to come in on this? Um, in the study, we didn't go beyond recognizing that there is a need for everyone to have access to information. So we didn't explore how that could be operationalized. However, one of the very interesting things that's happening during the COVID uh, period is how much more is being done about ensuring that migrants get access to information online, including the development of apps, for instance, both uh, for general sort of information relevant to everyone across the country, but also local like Newport City Council, for instance, just as one example, is developing its own app about what you need to know about Newport if you are new to living in the area. Um, one of the things that also is, is, is more evident in continental European cities uh, and localities than it is here, is actually having a place where you can go in the city if you are new to that city, Helsinki is an example, for instance, and get access to the information you need, including uh, advice on your immigration status. Um, that is the sort of thing that's been more thought about here, but very much interesting at a local level rather than that something that government, I think, is, is putting resources into. But anyway, I'm saying all that, not having looked at it in this study, but being aware of some of the things that are going on uh, elsewhere. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, Catherine, did you want to jump in? Uh, yes, I've got something also uh, not entirely within, within this project, but on that. Um, so there's a, a, an organisation called ACH uh, in Bristol who work on integration issues. They started off as just to do with housing, um, but they're working on integration issues. And one of the interesting projects that they've got is that they, they also have come to the conclusion that poorly paid, poor work is not a facilitator of integration. And they are very focused on income. And they think that you need uh, at least sort of the national average income to be able to fully engage in all the kinds of processes that policymakers might want people to fully engage with, to have the free time to be able to, to do this apart from anything else. So not having to work huge amounts of overtime and uh, have the resources to, to visit things, do things. Anyway, so they have been, um, and I think they particularly focus on refugees, um, but they've been trying to identify areas of skills shortage, areas of where there's a shortage of people to do work, where it's reasonably well paying work. So one of the areas they've got on cotton onto is bus driving, for example. Um, and this is post Brexit. I don't know uh, how many bus drivers are from Eastern Europe, but in Bristol, it seems quite a lot. Um, and post Brexit, this may be even become an area where we have more of a, a, an opening. So they're working with bus drivers. And that reminded me of a focus group that I did as part of this, this project with some migrant husbands um, in the north of England. And they were all working in, they'd all been here for less than five years, and they were all working in ethnic niches, in catering, you know, washing, dishwashing and back kitchen stuff, um, in um, uh, warehouse work, in niches where other, where they're working alongside other, um, other migrants. And for them, the only way out of that that they were familiar with was going onto the taxis. But you can't do that immediately because you need to build up your language skills, you need to build up a bit of capital to be able to get into the taxis, you need to build up your knowledge of where, that you, where you live. Um, and one of them, however, had just heard about a bus driving apprenticeship scheme where you could sign up to, to become a bus driver. And the others were all very excited because this was a completely new possibility. So I think, yes, it's, it's where are those, um, those opportunities that aren't um, incredibly poorly paid, 
uh, but equally is a broader issue of, of social justice and trying to tackle these issues of poorly paid work, because it's not just for migrants that this poor work uh, is very destructive. Um, it's a broader social issue that needs to be tackled. But in the short term, finding, finding other opportunities beyond the kind of um, the commonly known about the, the um, particularly taxi drivers, taxi driving, um, finding those opportunities for, uh, for different kinds of work and better kinds and better paid work, I think is quite key. Perhaps, Catherine, just, just to finish on that really important point, could make the connection back to the point that's well made in the book about instead of seeing family migration as a problem, actually seeing it as an asset, you know, it is an opportunity. And if we saw it in that way, we wouldn't be thinking about what is just any job somebody can get into because that gets them out of the unemployment. But what, what are the assets that this person have? What, what kind of opportunities could they take up if only some doors were opened for them? And if we looked at it in that way, um, then the policy solutions and the, the policy interventions that we'd be thinking about would, would be rather different. Yes, a really, really, really good point. Um, that rather than focusing on problems of integration, focusing on what's to be gained if we were to facilitate people's participation in all of these domains, I think is, is absolutely a key shift of perspective because um, family migrants, marriage migrants, these are the people, the categories of migrants who are most likely to stay long term. And we know, not just from our work, but from other people as well, that there are substantial levels of underused educational capital in this population. Um, but there just seems to be quite a fixed view um, in official circles that there's a that family migration is separate from labour migration or high skilled migration. So um, there was a report a couple of years ago um, from the Migration Advisory Committee um, on migration policy post Brexit, and the only place that you get family migrants mentioned there was as a source of possible low skilled workers to patch up the holes left by Europeans who would no longer be coming, um, which is, is problematic in so many ways. <laughs> One, because we know that these people aren't just hanging around. These people are already looking, they're already working, looking after children, looking after the elderly. Um, they're already busy, but also thinking that all that they can do is, is that low skilled work. Um, whereas if we want the brightest and best, if we took a fresh look at family migrants, we might well find, sorry, brightest and best for a non-British audience, that's the catchphrase for what, what our current government wants from the immigration system. Um, yeah, so if we want the brightest and best, we might turn around and realise that we've already got quite a lot of them. Thank you so much. If I may, I, I would have a question. Um, I wonder whether, so, so this famous uh, Levens hypothesis that, that uh, uh, women with a migration background actually choose a transnational partner to further their emancipation or their, uh, their let's say emancipation from traditional family values. Um, so the example you gave Catherine would confirm the hypothesis. Is that, is that the takeaway message from your book that Levens was right? So we have, we have a, what we call, talk about as a sort of moderated or adjusted Levens hypothesis. So we think that, that yes, we've got evidence that this, this does seem to be a possibility, but Levens thinks it only applies, just as only applies to more educated uh, women um, who are looking for this, um, this opportunity. Um, and we find also with women with lower levels of qualifications also narrating these kinds of gains. And they're not always just in terms of possibility of employment, it can be in other kinds of uh, autonomy and uh, domestic relations of power. Um, because, so uh, one thing that we haven't talked about so much is the, the extended families. Uh, these. Uh, it's very, very common for British South Asians to start off their marriages living in extended families and even more common for um, where marriage migration is involved, uh, unsurprisingly, because it takes a lot of resources um, and the, the migrant spouse doesn't usually bring huge amounts of economic capital to start with. So there can be a while where people are saving to, to live separately, or it can be that people want to stay uh, living together with their, with their parents and parents-in-law. 
Um, but so the, uh, the, the migrant husbands, all of the migrant husbands that we spoke to in this project, all of them were dependent on their wife and their family for their accommodation. Either they lived with them or they were living in accommodation that was owned or rented by their wife and or her family. Um, they're reliant on their, their family, the, their fa family in law for connections to employment. Um, and in many ways, and the wife has uh, her family uh, close at hand, usually supportive of her in case of any kind of conflict. Um, so the, the domestic uh, relations of power can be rather different from what people might uh, imagine or from stereotypes of, of, of South Asian family relationships. Um, what was the other thing that Lewin's? Oh yes, so not just uh, not just the the employed women, not just the uh, uh, sorry highly educated women, not just in terms of employment, but also Lewin's writes about um, these transnational marriages as offering to liberate women from the expectations not just of their in-laws who remain overseas, but of their own families here, and we found that often not to be the case, that one of the advantages for women was precisely that they, they wanted to be able to stay near their families and their social networks, which again uh, uh, would be useful for them, wouldn't be uprooted and starting from scratch again um, uh, in their marriages. So we, we certainly find some evidence for this, um, and, but we, we don't find, we don't agree with all of the aspects of Levens's model. We think it's a, a, a more diverse category of uh, women who are uh, engaged in this. Oh, and that it's not always uh, a, a premeditated strategy. So the example I gave today was kind of one of them, one of the sisters finds that this works well and gives a tip to the other one. Uh, but sometimes it was just the, the logics of, of what happens. So you accept this, this marriage and then you find that you don't have the daughter-in-law duties um, and that you have perhaps certain other advantages. So um, uh, modified Levin's hypothesis model is what we're suggesting. Thank you very much. Um, that brings us to the close of this session. Unless one of the authors has a last Comment, no, you're all satisfied. So, um, no, sorry, please. Oh, there is a, there is one more question in the chat, but it doesn't look like it's a question that can be dealt with within three minutes. Um, so perhaps if the, if the author of the question would like to uh, email us, we can, we can maybe deal with that uh, by email. Very good. Then I, uh, I thank the audience for joining us today and for sharing uh, their questions. Thank you, Kaveri Qureshi, for taking the time to read the book and reflect on it. And thanks a million to the authors for writing this book and, uh, and for talking about it to us today. Thank you. And thank you, Saskia, for being such a wonderful uh, host today as well and for your, you. for your comments on the book. And Karen.